So, Gig, we talked uh, when I was on the road, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You, we yeah. talked on the phone, and uh, I think you were going, you were going through like some mountains, and uh, I, can't, yeah. I can't remember. You, you were going through. Uh, where were you heading? You were like heading to Utah. Yeah, we were on the way to Slam Dance. That's right. That's right. I heard yeah. it was uh, very successful. It was. It went pretty well. It was fun. It was a hell of a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> So, so you guys are uh, must be really proud now that uh, this is available. I believe it's available now on VOD. Am I correct? Yeah, just since Tuesday. So it's pretty exciting. Yeah. Well, let's 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 get let's get started with uh, the sim very simple question: How did this all came about? How did you two meet? What's the origin story? <laughs> <laughs> well, I uh, I yeah, <laughs> I've done this one before. Uh, you know, I started learning taxidermy uh, just as a hobby. You know, I was spending a lot of time in front of the computer and was looking for something more old school, school and tactile that, you know, could kind of just get me away from the computer, you know, and do something with my hands. And I got some books from the library and then I found a forum uh, on the internet that had all the best taxidermists in the world on there, you know, sharing tips with each other and helping beginners like me. And pretty quickly I became more interested in those characters. They were just fascinating. And Ken was one of them. And I started becoming more interested in following these storylines and, and thinking that there would be an interesting documentary there about taxidermy than actually in learning it. And so uh, I just kind of started, you know, just researching and watching. And, and then when it became time, I decided I was going to go ahead and and get started on it. Ken was the first one I called. And, you know, I knew about Ken because, you know, he specialized in these recreations, which are a real unique, you know, form of taxidermy. They require a lot of research and creativity and, and his Irish elk and panda and saber tooth tiger were a really big deal. You know, people talked about them all the time. Um, so I thought he'd be a good subject. And then I called him and we talked for a while and he told me he was going to make a Bigfoot, and that's when I knew I found the movie. <laughs> how, how do you feel about that, Ken, that uh, you're one of the best taxidermists uh, in the world, and uh, what made you want to join um, onto a documentary? Well, I, I, don't like, I don't like calling myself the best because I know so many good taxidermists. I am accomplished, um, you know, because I've entered competitions and I've won titles and things, uh, but... Also, too, I, I have a, I don't have a lot of trouble speaking for the industry and, and things like that. I can, I can usually be as eloquent as possible. And so, and I'm, I'm kind of at home in front of a camera. And so it wasn't really something new when, when Dan made the request. I just didn't realize he was making a feature length film, but I figured it out pretty quick. But um, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was interesting. And then, you know, the whole idea of making this, this Sasquatch from the Patterson film you know, and then the, it's, it's a unique project to begin with, and the fact that it was going to be documented, I thought, well, that was good, you know. But now that the movie's done, uh, I realized that he did. So uh, I think I, I'm, I'm very happy that I accepted the project. And, and, of course, me and Dan are buddies now, so it's all good. <laughs> oh. How, how was this filmed? Um, I believe it filmed over uh, three years, but how, how much of uh, you know, um, Ken's life was actually documented and what, what, what did we see in our, what more like what we didn't see out, out of Ken's life on, on this documentary? You know, I think it, I covered it pretty well. Um, you know, the bulk of the movie was shot in three years and then a little bit, little bits and pieces over the next two years, uh, just to kind of fill in some gaps. But uh, yeah, I think that you, you know, you get an idea of, of how he works, you know, and that he's, you know, he's up there kind of in the middle of nowhere, you know, uh, it's, it's not very uh, accessible. Uh, it takes a while to get there and, um, and it's cold <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, I tried to, to get, you know, his family involved and, because, you know, it's, uh, he's not from a family of taxidermists, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of a unique thing to have your kid, you know, collecting critters and shoving them in the freezer. And, and uh, yeah, I just tried to kind of, you know, make an overall portrait 
you know, of Ken. And, and it, you know, of course, some strange things happened. And I always tell people, if you hang out with somebody that's eccentric for long enough, something <laughs> exciting is bound to happen. And, and that's kind of what happened. And, uh, yeah, you know, it was interesting to be there and catch that kind of life transformation. He, he, he filmed so much. Like, we, we, like, there was a lot of things that could have been in this movie that were cut, you know. And, of course, for, as far as I'm concerned, the only thing that I would have liked to have seen a little more of was a lot of our uh, drunken karaoke with Benita. <laughs> <laughs> There's, I still have plenty of that. We'll do a special yeah, but, but that, cut. So <laughs> that, that was a lot of fun. We, we went down there and, and uh, sang that she's a karaoke host that uh, comes out to the hotel. And, and we had a lot of fun down there drinking beer and singing karaoke. So we had a lot of fun. Can can you? Um, I like you uh, personally. I mean, because you, you're you're so open um, during the documentary. Why why were you so okay? I mean, what did uh what did Dan? How did Dan convince you to be uh, so you know so open minded in for for this documentary, revealing your personal you know life at, at the same time? Well, I've I've been in documentaries before, uh, and especially one with the BBC uh, some years back in two thousand six, I believe. And to be honest, I wasn't open at first. I was guarded. I had to figure out exactly, I had to make sure there was no agenda. With the BBC, there was an agenda. And I figured that out really quick. Um, it took me a little bit, you know, Dan told me to loosen up, but I had to make sure that he wasn't, you know, doing something for PETA or something like that. And, uh, and, and you know, it, I, I was actually guarded at first, Dan will tell you. But it, it didn't take very long till I realized, you know what, this guy's going to put me on display for his you know, crazy as I am, so I thought, I'll let him do it, what the heck. Talk, talk about the Patty, the Sasquatch that you actually develop. I mean, she's, what, eight feet tall, and you virtually uh, right. had to transport her all over the country just, just for display. Well, uh, she's a, just, a, just a shade under seven feet tall, um, and that's the exact uh, height that she was in the film, too. Uh, all the parameters were carefully taken and I made a size chart and uh, the bottom of her foot was up and I measured the pad and I made a, a measuring stick from a 15 inch because I know that the, you can buy the tracks they're 15 inches long so I was able to measure using that as a, as a measuring device I was able to measure the all of the bone lengths the joints where they were and I made a big um, a chart and then uh, a guy named John Green many years ago had gone to the site and measured the trees and he made a chart too and our charts were identical. So then I trusted his chart. Um, and, and so, um, yeah, she's just like the, the big males, they have like a 19 inch footprint and they stand about 10 feet tall. Uh, I have friends who've seen them. And, uh, but I, I didn't have pictures of a big male. I only had the film of the Patterson that I, you know, could get a good look at. And uh, yeah, no, I gave, I gave the Sasquatch to Dan. It, she, Dan owns uh, Patty now. Um, you know, I, I felt like I made it too fast. I felt, feel like I want to make another one. And uh, I can make one much better, I think. And, uh, and also, too, Dan spent all his money and everything else and took a big chance on me. So, you know, that, that model is, is now a piece of history. And I think that it's only fitting that Dan, who invested his time and took a chance on me, owns it. Because I can make another one. Wow. So... So Dan, you actually have the the Sasquatch. Where 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 is she at? In, She's in living standing room? over there in my living room, uh, keeping an eye on me. Um, you know, we had plans to to go to more festivals and and tour with her and and go to you know. I had some limited theatrical setup, but when the pandemic hit, that kind of killed all those plans. And I, I have a few more things planned for October. We'll see if you know if things line up I don't know um but yeah that was the idea you know at, at the time was to haul her around in the big fur van and and you know she's a big attraction people love it you know people uh you know one thing I learned it at, at slam dance it took me a while uh because I took her to a few more locations after that and you know I can move her by myself but it's not very easy especially if she has to go through a doorway and so I'll usually recruit somebody just walking by it, you know if I'm if it's just me and they always look at me real funny when I ask them to help move her and then you see them thinking about it 
and then they think, okay, and then they get so into it because they realize that they're moving this Bigfoot around, you know, and everybody's staring and everybody wants to know what's going on. And, and so it was real fun to kind of recruit people <laughs> around the country or at least around the Northwest to do that. Um, but yeah, she, uh, you know, she'll probably end up in a museum somewhere. You know, I don't, I don't know if I have enough room to keep her here forever. I, my girlfriend kind of every once in a while makes a suggestion that she needs to find <laughs> a different place. <laughs> she takes up a lot of real estate, as they say. No turn. You can't return her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dan, since you spent three years with, uh, with Ken, did you, and you were like an amateur taxidermist yourself, did you learn anything? And how, how did you resist not to uh, help out Ken with the, all of his taxidermy stuff? <laughs> well, he sure, he sure as hell doesn't need my help. Uh, I did learn a lot. And, um, you know, I, I was, you know, very busy running, you know, sometimes two cameras at once and trying to do sound. And, you know, I'm a one-man crew. So there was really no time. And, and a lot of times, you know, I would ask him things to explain what he's doing, but I wouldn't really be able to pay attention because I'm, I'm shooting, you know. And uh, later I would watch the film, you know, watch the footage and, you know, it was like being in a class, you know, I could, I, you know, I, en I ended up learning more sometimes by watching the footage, you know, later at home than I did by being there in the shop. But then I'd go back again and I'd get to ask him questions. So he really did teach me a ton. And, and I mean, I wish I had time to just go up there and work with him instead of, you know, with no cameras, you know. Um, and someday, someday I'll probably do that. <laughs> but yeah, he's a, he's a good teacher and, and very knowledgeable, you know, he's been doing it for a long time and some of it, you know, I mean, you know, for me who I don't sew, you know, and so that's just like a really complicated thing for me. And it's just second nature for Ken. He can just, you know, talk to the camera while he's sewing up a muskox. <laughs> you think, <laughs> you'd think that'd be really hard, but it's, He's a pro. <laughs> and, and Ken, what, what drives you now? I mean, obviously taxidermy, um, you go from project to project, but what's, what's actually, what, what's, what's your drive? What's actually motivating you to, to continue this uh, important hobby? Well, motivation's in a really short supply these days, I have to admit. Um, I've been doing it so long, I would, I'm getting to the point now where I'd like to do other things, you know. So I'm branching out into creating product. Uh, like sculpting forms, you know, the grab one. See, this is a, this is a roe deer. I just sculpted this, and there'll, it'll, there'll be a, a production mold made of this. And uh, what, when, when it goes to the supply companies, people will order it, and I'll get 10% of retail on every one they sell. And that's kind of what I want to be able to do is, is head into my retirement down the road, uh, making uh, royalty money, uh, artist royalties for these sculptures. Um, because Lord knows I'm not going to have a, no, none of us really going to have a pension. They spent it all, you know. You know, Up here in Canada, the only thing you have to look forward to in old age is, is euthanasia. So I want to make sure I have some money. <laughs> but, uh, but I'm doing that. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to invest my time into things that will pay dividends down the road. I'm trying to work smarter instead of harder. You know, but, but I mean, I'm always motivated too by going hunting with my son and, and traveling. I've been teaching people in Eastern Europe. Uh, I, I was in China teaching them how to do panda bears and I've been traveling all over the world. This pandemic canceled a lot of great trips, but uh, I'm hoping that the world will come back to that. Uh, so I'm, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to keep myself interested without doing the same thing I've done for the last 40 years. Yeah, and, and I found it very fascinating that, uh, that Dan actually included your music into into the documentary are you still keeping up with your uh, mu music life yeah yeah i'm getting ready to uh record another original song i wrote it a long time i've got a bunch of songs i wrote a long time ago and i'm getting ready to to record those um one one is ready to record uh the other ones i, I still have to work on but you know just it's it's Right now, it's really hard because they're raising prices up here in Canada. They're raising taxes of all things during a pandemic, and it's getting and people don't have expendable money to pay for luxuries, which is what I do. Uh, so it's been really hard collecting money and paying bills as of late. Uh, so I'm, I've got my eye real carefully on that situation. Um, you know, I'm, I'm finding myself with a lot less free time than I would like. 
you know, so I've got to, I've got to come up with some solutions to those problems and, you know, selling the product I'm hoping will help. Yep, absolutely. Well, let me, let me wrap it up with one, one more simple thing, because obviously it's, it's a silly question to ask during times like this, but, uh, but how, how are you two staying creative or staying sane in, in, the, in, the, in a time like this that we're actually going through? Wow, you know, it's, um, you know, the movie release has been a big distraction, so it's good, you know. I mean, I've been getting everything ready for the release and, you know, doing a lot of press and, and publicity and, and, you know, getting the word out online. And, you know, that's finally starting. I think, you know, it's been a week. So I think, you know, in another week or two, that should slow down. You know, honestly, I'm hoping to finish up some taxidermy projects that I started and never finished, you know. So I've got little bits and pieces sitting around and and just, you know, ha haven't really had any free time. And and so, yeah, it's, uh, it, the, the pandemic hasn't really changed things much for me because I work from home mostly when I'm not in production. So, you know, I mean, instead of traveling around to the festivals and doing some theatrical and promotions that way, I've just been at home getting ready for the digital release. So, you know, I think things may change here in a few weeks uh, when things slow down a little bit. Well, out here in Alberta Beach, it's nothing's really changed. Uh, we don't have any mask bylaws or anything else. The, the grocery stores are stocked up with food, nobody's sick. Um, you know, so it's really normal until I go into the city or into the bigger towns, you know, then I start, you know, I have to follow arrows and stand on X's and, and you know, uh, but the thing that it's affected me the mostly because I have a lot of friends that come from outside the country to visit and to stay with me. Uh, and I really enjoy that. And also I travel to Europe quite a bit and those two things are cut out and that kind of, uh, it's kind of a bummer, you know. But, uh, but it's, easy, it's easy to keep myself busy with projects and things like that. And, and since nothing's really changed to where I live, I'm very fortunate. So I'm counting my blessings. That is, that, that is a great thing to, uh, to think about. Count your blessings. Well, hey, thank you uh, very much uh, for speaking with me. Hey, congratulations on finally the VOD release and a hun what was it, 100% on uh, Rotten Tomatoes? That's yeah, right, right now we are. <laughs> that's, that's quite an accomplishment. So, uh, thank you. So ho hopefully uh, down the road, uh, another documentary, another taxidermy uh, project, and we get to talk about this again. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> All right, well, thanks a lot, Jig. Okay, thanks. bye now. All right, bye. Appreciate it.